Uh, I'm really happy today. I got the print out of my new book about um, edible ferns. And today I wanted to show you um, how to make bracken flower. Uh, bracken is one of the ferns. It's very controversial because of the alleged um, carcinogenic properties. And I explain, you know, that uh, in the book actually, when it's dangerous and how to process it. But in this film, because it's a very broad topic, and there'll be lots of details in the book. But uh, in this um, in this little video, I wanted to show you just how to make bracken flower. The film is recorded in um, winter, and now it's spring, but I was waiting until the release of the book to combine it together. Uh, the book has 190 pages. It's mainly descriptive with um, monographs of 17 genera, uh, containing around 80 species with some black and white drawings and pictures from my journeys, mainly from China, but also Korea, Laos, and pictures of my experiments with eating ferns and, um, um, you know, advice uh, how dangerous, how, you know, if it's safe to eat some of the species or not. Uh, some recipes from various countries, uh, like... Um, China, Japan, Korea, Thailand, Laos, the Philippines, Indonesia, Nepal, India, and the Canadian recipe from um, Polish minority. Um, I think this book goes a bit deeper than most uh, foraging books and, um, you know, w focuses on one group of edible plants and really tries to explore it in details, in every single detail you can imagine that we know about this group. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, hi everyone, greetings from Poland on this snowy morning. I decided to collect some uh, bracken underground parts called rhizomes, sometimes roots, but actually the proper name is rhizomes. Um, this is the plant. It's, it's a kind of fern, but it has another name. It's called bracken. And in some countries it's really, really common, like for example, in Britain, in pastures, in parts of France, but in many parts of the world, actually, it's a common plant. So these are the rhizomes, underground stalks looking like roots, but the real roots are the small ones. But these rhizomes are very nutritious. Look, this is a cross section. All the white stuff is starch. It's um, uh, difficult to quantify how much starch you can actually get from it. Some sources say only 5% um, of the weight of the rhizomes um, can be turned into uh, flour, but actually there's more starch, but during the process of um, taking it out, of course, you lose something. Um, all this field, everywhere, there's bracken here. Maybe 50% of the plants is bracken. You cannot see it now, the leaves are dead, but um, I, this is near my house, so I see it, you know, all the time, and I know where to look for it. This is a funny fern because each leaf comes uh, out from the ground separately. So, you, you know, you, normally you, when you see ferns, you would have like five, ten leaves coming out from the same place. No, here it's only one leaf, and usually they cover a large area. So this would be like a super organism. Some people say it's one of the oldest organisms on Earth. Um, an example of, it's called polycormone. It's like a, this network of underground parts which are connected and, you know, help each other. And um, the idea of getting these, um, these rhizomes as food actually arose in many places in the world. So, because it's a very widespread fern, bracken, pteridium aquilinum, sometimes divided into smaller species, but generally it's a, it's a very similar plant everywhere was used in many places all the way from Alaska to New Zealand. And the most widespread uses were in the northwest of um, North America, among various indigenous groups. Also, it's still used as food in Japan, China and Korea, and also in some other parts of Asia as well. New Zealand it was very important food for the Maori, like they would burn vast uh, areas of ground um, just to support the growth of bracken. Actually, if we look at uh, pollen and spore profiles from 
um, archaeobotanical studies, pale paleobotanical studies in Europe, we see that um, often there is, at some points, there is a, a large increase of, of bracken. Of course, it shows that the land um, was then mainly covered by non-woody vegetation, because bracken thrives outside the forest. It can grow in the forest, but actually, you know, it's much happier outside it. But also it was, um, like here, it's, it's much bigger than the forest. It's much easier also to take the roots out. And um, people probably burned, burned it on purpose. So wherever there, there are traces of bracken in, in, in your old, you know, layers, it usually meant there was a lot of uh, fire, in, uh, maybe burned forest, but also very often it was on purpose because probably people also here in Europe uh, use this um, as um, food. There's one problem with this plant. It's, um, it's quite toxic. Actually, there are cases of uh, animal poisoning if you feed cows on, on, you know, or other you know, herbivores on it. For a long time, they will develop various kinds of cancer and they can get poisoned before it. So there are a few problematic chemicals in it. One is uh, ptachylozide, which is the, the most carcinogenic natural uh, substance in plants. Second is tiaminase, which deprives, uh, breaks down vitamin B1, so it causes beriberi illness, so like ataxia on nerves, and also you cannot eat it for a long time. And the second, the third is um, also uh, contains uh, cyanide. But all these, um, all these problems can be solved by preparation, by processing. Uh, usually connected with, you know, boiling, leaching, and then when you get the the the, the final product, actually, is not that dangerous, because bracken uh, bracken is used to make starch commonly in China and Japan, and in China you can buy noodles made of bracken in many places, and people consume it in large amounts. And of course, there are some s studies so showing that there is an increased, you know, incidence of um, uh, cancer uh, of um, digestive tract in some parts of China and Japan, but there are so many factors. These people that eat so many plants and, you know, um, I, I don't think it's caused by industrially processed bracken. Of course, um, people in these countries mainly use um, fiddleheads, fronds, young fronds in spring, but this is the ancient way of getting calories. Actually, in Japan, there are many uh, many um, uh, sources, many accounts of famine where people survive the famine eating this plant. But it's a common article of food. It's not, not only famine food. Also in China, I lived with a friend in Norwich uh, several years ago uh, from China, and uh, I once brought um, a bracken uh, from somewhere, dug it out. And he started crying. And I said, why are you crying? And he said, oh, because my mother survived the great famine eating this plant. And I feel so, every time I see it, I see I see so, so affectionate towards it. It's called jue cai in Chinese, by the way. So, and jue cai is actually the, the, the above part and the, the un underground part um, is um, it's called jue gen. Jue gen, jue gen fen is the is the um, you know the noodle um in in korea it's called kosari and in um in japan it's called warabi um and everyone in east asia knows this plant even if they they haven't eaten it uh so how the starch is actually taken out from from these roots so um there are um various, you know, modifications of this, of this technique. But the most important one is that the sections of, of um, uh, rootstock like this, of rhizomes, are bashed, you know, with like, often like wooden mallets are used in Asia, but like can be bashed with stones or probably with a hammer and um, squashed, yeah? So the, the, you disintegrate the, the starchy bits and then you put it in a trough and then um, you kind of shake the trough and take the top layer of water. And the idea is that the three, mm, three fractions are formed. One is the solution where most of the toxins are. One is the heavy fiber and one is the starch. 
So, you know, there would be a layer of starch and the layer of fiber in um, at the bottom of the of the vessel. And um, as far as I know, in Japan, they even sold like two sorts of starch. One was the expensive one, the white one, which had, you know, few traces of this dark fiber. And the cheaper one was, you know, less pure, probably also more uh, bitter and, you know, less tasty. Uh, I I started experimenting with, with bracken. It's, it's really fun. And another way of actually... Uh, processing it is uh, cutting it into small bits and boiling for a very long time like many hours maybe nine hours taking the water out and then um, then you can uh, grind everything all the bits so the 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 fibrous bits as well in a coffee grinder and you get like brown powder and then when you make bread out of it it tastes a bit like German pumpernickel kind of very brown bread, but really tasty. I find uh, bracken flour extremely tasty. And um, one of my daughters, it's her favorite noodle. Wherever I came back from China, she would always ask me, Daddy, have you brought some bracken uh, noodles? Because she just loved it. So don't get prejudiced. Um, in in Japan, they make like a it's kind of cake some something kind of sweet called um, warabi mochi uh, which is a deli deli delicacy made from from this flour mixed with sugar and water uh, so there are various dishes you know from uh, from this plant there is um there are very few records of um bracken being eaten in um in europe one of them is in in a work by Michał Federowski, a Polish ethnographer from um, uh, from the 19th century, uh, the turn of 19th and 20th century, he um, he recorded memories of the rhizomes being used as famine food in northern Belarus. Um, also, the, it was used to make uh, flour in France during the French Revolution, so there was some tradition in France. And um, also in the Canary Islands, it's not Europe actually, it's Africa, but um, technically. Um, in Canary Islands, it was very important uh, article of food. A special bread was made called gofio, which was a mixture of bracken, uh, uh, bracken flour and barley flour. But it's not used, uh, not used anymore, but there are many accounts, maybe not many, but some accounts of it in, from the Canary Islands. One of them is Betanson, and then um, also Humboldt, when he stopped uh, on his uh, journey um, in the Canary Islands, he also mentioned mentioned this. Um, so fascinating plant, because it's used in so many countries, had such bad reputation, and actually in some countries is the best source of starch. Because it's a lot of it. Actually, this uh, this um, this tangle of roots. It took me about ten minutes to dig it out. Once I I got ten kilos, and it took me an hour. But there are places I would actually struggle, and the the rhizomes are deep. I uh, when I read ethnographic accounts and the, the detailed accounts, I also mentioned that people were trying to find places which were open, where the bracken was like big, robust. So really go for places where there's a lot of bracken, not like you see, you know, a few plants in the forest and try to get out. Because in the forest you have a lot of roots from trees and other plants and it's really difficult to get it out. But if you go to a pasture, to an abandoned field, it should be quite easy. You know, especially on light soils, it should be uh, quite easy. People who relied on bracken, they would really recognize various sorts of bracken. When you read about the accounts on, on, about the Maori in New Zealand, they they really had like a few kinds of of bracken roots. Um, one thing, uh, in some accounts, they say they would dry the roots before uh, taking the, the starch, but in some not. So I haven't experimented enough to actually see the difference, but maybe you should also try with the the, the dried rhizomes and then bash them and, and try to get the, the starch out. I think for me the adventure with bracken is, is just beginning. I'm not talking here about the, the fronds because it's another story. They're quite bitter and I know that in Japan people would put um, soda or wood ash 
with hot water overnight and they would soak them in this and uh, this decreases the, the, bitter, the bitterness. Uh, I think it's a kind of plant that all the survival bushcraft people should actually know and experiment with because it's a, it's a very good source of starch, yeah, which is very important in survival situations. It's actually very, very important. And here I'm digging out bracken rhizomes. There's a really a lot of it. You just move the ground and it's everywhere. And uh, native tribes would use uh, digging sticks made of very hard wood like yew tree or maybe antlers. But I use this spade. Also it's useful because I can easily cut the rhizomes. Although actually it's not that difficult to cut it with your hand. Just pull it. Uh, one more thing, you dig out the rhizomes in the cold season, autumn, winter, and until until the leaves come out from the ground, because once the leaves are out, the rhizomes will be empty, won't have starch. I washed the uh, uh, rhizomes. I'm inside the house now because it's very cold today, very windy. And you see, I'm bashing the the rhizomes with a stone. you can see all the white bits this is starch so actually you don't cut it you just bash it and the whole grains of white starch come out and um, it's um, it's logical because you know why would you peel the rhizomes there are also black uh, black fibers inside so you have to apply the certain amount of uh, strength which um, is like not too strong so that you don't break the the black stuff, just uh, just so that you can separate the white and the black. Uh, by the way, this is a, um, a stone I brought from Nepal. It's a, it's traditionally used for um, this kind of mortar, so like flat. Uh, very convenient. Actually, I use it for everything: for walnuts, for coffee, for many things. You can you can crash with this. Now we put the crushed bracken rhizomes into warm water. I, I find warm water easier to work with later. Not hot, don't boil the starch, but just like lukewarm to, it's better to, um, for diluting the starch and just like wiggle and, and mix and kind of check if there are, there are any grains left, kind of scrub it as much as you can. First, the, the solution is becomes white because the starch goes and then some other substances make it brown so don't get scared it will be like coffee colored it's not it's not mud the rhizomes were washed well and then we're gonna sieve it now i see the solution for this sieve you can see some debris left lots of you know fiber left there are still some pieces of, of starch, but they are quite difficult to get out, like 100%. You'd have to have a special machine kind of mixing it. But I think I got like half, at least half. So this solution should settle like 12 hours or something. And then we can tip off what is uh, at the top. So now the solution waited for 24 hours and um, we should uh, scoop the, the top of the water and then there should be sediment at the bottom.
you see this is the starch rich um, sediment which should be dried or maybe settle a few hours more but it was difficult for me to um, to separate it straight away so from half a kilo of um, fresh rootstock I got about 15 gram of this um, very thick sludge we'll see how many grams of dry flour it will yield but um, the fresh when you compare the fresh uh, weight is uh, 500 to 15 it's um, three percent and this is day two the sediment from the first day is already dry you can see flakes coming off it's super dry we're gonna wait in a minute and um, here is the sediment from the things I, from the water I, I took out the first day. You know, I wanted to make sure that maybe there is some more starch left. So there is a bit left, so I'm going to dry it today. So this will be extra yield from today. Eight gram, eight gram of super dry flour. Maybe there will be another one gram tomorrow. Um, and this is the second day. So this is what we got yesterday, you remember. And this is a little bit more we got uh, the next day from the things I, um, the, the, the liquid I left. Actually, there was still some starch, much less, but it seems to be better quality with more white starch. You can see the actual white powder. So. It's not so easy to separate it and the brown layer also contains a lot of starch and um, from what I, what, I, uh, what I read in Japan uh, they even had like different sorts of starch so the, the white one was the most mm, expensive but it's still quite bitter it's, it's, it's okay you can eat it but it's, it's not it's not without the bitter taste uh, but the amount of this um, starch from, from the second sedimentation is really low. My scales, in my scales, cannot even cross one gram. So it's just like a little bit added. So this is what I got uh, adding flour from today and yesterday. Exactly 10 gram. So we need um, around 50 kilos of fresh rhizomes to make a kilo of such flour because this one comes from 500 gram of fresh rhizomes. It is probably doable in one day for one person, but it really means like working the whole day, digging out and uh, cleaning. I remember once I got out 10 kilos of fresh rhizomes in an hour, so we could say that a very fit um, uh, person working in the field every day could probably gather it in five hours, plus the cleaning, which is, um, probably another, you know, two or three hours and, and mushing. Mushing is not time so, so time consuming, but it is probably a full day's work to get a kilo of flour. But, you know, imagine in, in the times of famine, I mean, with one kilo of flour, you can probably feed like um, more than one person. So actually people could, produ could um, get themselves more calories that they used so it was it was important for survival and much depends on the size of rhizomes i can imagine that if you do it in um in a warm climate on rich soil when the rhizomes are big you can get better efficiency you can you can you know dig out more and maybe even when you have larger rhizomes you uh, you get more flower because I gathered them, of course, from a good location, a sunny, not like from forest, but I live in cold temperate zone, you know, a place with um, not so a hot climate. So the, um, the bracken which grows in my place is probably about 130 centimeters tall. And when I go to England, I see bracken which is like two meters tall. So I can imagine you can probably get more flower from such uh, bracken. Uh, I think now when we've published lots of general guides about edible plants, it's time to go into detail and go um, and 
you know, explore certain groups and find out how to how to eat them and um, how they were processed in different traditional societies and put it together. I, I hope it's only the first from a series of, bo of books I'm going to publish about different plant groups and how you can eat them.